Hello, 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 beautiful creatures of the internet. I'm Mango Jones. I am running way behind today. It has, uh, it's been a day. So, as always, before I get started, uh, in the description, there are links to reproductive health resources, including the National Abortion Fund, um, Angel Flights, which will help get you free flights to wherever you need to go for medical services, uh, plan C pills, things like that. There are also LGBTQIA plus resource hubs, and there are links to all of the other members of the Stream First family. Okay, all of that out of the way. I am so sorry that I am so late. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a day. It's a fucking day. Uh, I'll say hi to people, and then we're gonna jump into this, because this has been one of the funnest things that I've ever researched. I had so much fun doing this, and y'all are gonna learn way too much information because I'm ADHD as shit, and I think it's all relevant. So, <sighs> yeah. Uh, Jenny for life. I love you too. You're so pretty. Hi, Sydney. Slim. Lizard. Hey, Seth. How are you this morning? It's nice to see you here. I'd, like, never see you at my streams, so welcome. I, I'm just... It's a date. Okay, so... Today's topic is broadcast signal intrusions of the 1980s. Specifically, U.S. signal intrusions, because there have been multiple signal intrusions that have happened, like, everywhere. Uh, most notably, though is that the vast majority of signal broadcast hijackings that happen like overseas happen during times of conflict and war. And when they happened over here, they weren't for those reasons. These were just stupid. So let's get started. Uh, so HBO launched on November 8th, 1972 as the first paid network available through cable service is in like the Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania area through Sterling Cable. In early 1973, HBO expanded into New York through Time Life's Manhattan Cable Company because Time Life had started the purchase of HBO. Uh, the, the expansion allowed them to be in an area that offered around 100,000 subscribers, but they only really maintained around 8,000. Part of that was due to a high turnover rate because people would subscribe, but there was just, there wasn't enough content for them to stick with HBO, which is understandable because at the time, like a lot of companies did not have the money to make their own content like that. Oh no, I went robot. Oh shit. They did get me. Oh, hold on. Where's the other? Mm -hmm. Let me know when it's fixed. I, I told y'all it's been a day. Didn't I? Didn't I? I did. Um. Hmm. I, I don't know what's happening today. I'm at a loss. Is it better? Is it worse? Please tell me. Hang on. Do-do-do. Do-do-do.
Do do. So, okay. Is it fixed? Is it better? Does it sound better? No. <laughs> I told y'all, it's a day. It's a fucking day. Ugh. Okay, so, moving along. Like I was saying, HBO, they only had around 8,000 subscribers. There was a really big turnover rate for their service because there was a lack of content. But to be fair, in the 1970s, it was really hard to get funding to be able to make content for pay services like that. And there really weren't all that many. There was HBO. Go fucking figure. Also, cable networks did have that issue as well. Like, everyone was having the problem. So, HBO wanting to expand their subscriber base and be able to produce more programming or buy more programming because they weren't an ad-based system. Uh, like, cable networks also wanted to expand in the same way. They realized the issue in trying to set up, like, an expanded relay tower network to get their programming elsewhere. It was labor-intensive, it was costly, time-consuming, and they would have to rely on shipping out videotapes from one center to another regional center. And that is just not going to work. It's not cool. At the time, the FCC was working with NASA, the National Academy of Sciences, Teleprompter, who was the largest cable network at the time, and Hughes Corporation to be able to open satellite communication primarily used for telephone and radio transmissions to television transmissions. Because most satellites could potentially do video transmission as well as audio. In 1973, in June, the National Cable Association had their annual convention and Teleprompter teamed up with Scientific Atlantic and HBO to do the first cross-nation feed. The feed was transmitted from Atlanta, Georgia to Anaheim, California through the Canadian ANIK2 satellite as no television satellites had been launched in the U.S. yet. The programming consisted of a morning feed featuring greetings from Speaker of the House Carl Albert in Washington, D.C., and an evening feed of the championship boxing match between Jimmy Ellis and Ernie Shavers from Madison Square Garden. Now, this demonstration was highly fucking successful. Uh, it piqued the interest of cable companies with and broadcast studios, and more than a dozen companies indicated a willingness co to contribute $5,000 each to fund a study and establish the cable satellite access entity so that they could figure out how to get their programming fed across the country. That's weird, Yato. YouTube doesn't like... Ed. YouTube doesn't like me. I swear. I told y'all. It's a fucking day. Anyway. Moving along. Uh, with cable interests, like, on the decline because of the lack of content and lack of cable access across America. Because, I mean, even major cities did not have cable access because it was just so hard and so costly to get those relay towers out there. So a lot of people were stuck with regular broadcast television. Uh, the need for satellite feeds for broadcast was apparent, and by the end of 1974, the We Star satellite was officially in orbit while RCA was preparing their SATCOM-1 satellite, and they started selling transponder time. HBO signed a contract with RCA. It cost them $7.5 million for a five-year term, and they bulk ordered Scientific Atlantic dishes for their cable head-ins. UA Columbia Cable Company, who already received microwave feed transmissions of HBO in Wayne, New Jersey, and Brookhaven, New York, signed on with HBO for the satellite expansion to bring HBO's feed to their Florida system and to their local unaffiliated systems. ATC, another cable company, ended up signing on to the deal as well so that they could get HBO's feed in Jackson, Mississippi. So you have all of these big cable companies wanting HBO so their 
spending all of this money just so they can have satellite time. And that's like HBO is the reason that satellite TV exists. So September 30th, 1975, HBO became the first television network to continuously deliver its signal via satellite. The day's programming included speeches by FCC Chairman Richard Wiley and Time Incorporated, HBO's parent company, because they did finish the like buyout. Uh, Andrew Hiskelly. Uh, two films, Brother of the Wind and Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. And the main event was Thrilla from Manila, the championship boxing match between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. Uh, it was beamed via satellite from the Araneta Coliseum in the Philippines. The boxing event was a huge fucking marketing move for HBO because it not only demonstrated the power of the satellite system, but it was a highly publicized sporting event that would otherwise be unavailable to television viewers in the U.S. There was no way for them to be able to see it without HBO. In mid-1976, a year after HBO started broadcasting via satellite, Stanford University electrical earring engineering professor H. Taylor Howard built his own 15-foot satellite dish, antenna amplifier, and receiver that could receive C-band satellite signals, the same signals received by cable television head-ins. After watching movies from HBO, Taylor wrote them a letter and sent them a check for $100 and was like, hey, I was watching your movies. This is how I did it. And they sent him the check back and wrote their own letter saying, we don't deal with individual peoples, just corporations. So he wrote a book. He wrote the Howard Terminal Manual, which explained the technology to other engineers. And in like the 1980s, he did help start uh, Chaparral Communications, which built the satellite systems and sold them to people that wanted to watch satellite. So, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Ted Turner, at the time, owned uh, a super station in Atlanta called WTCG. And they saw the potential for distribution of the network because of HBO and began delivering his own feed in 1976 in December. Because WTCG was ad-based, unlike HBO, they could be offered to subscribers without like an additional charge and it was appealing to cable operators and cost them like 10 cent per subscriber for the feed so as soon as they joined up pbs and wg in chicago which is another independent superstation they decided to work it out and they ended up getting on the satellite in november of 1978 trust me this is all important i swear okay so October 18th, 1979, the FCC began allowing people to have home satellite earth stations without a federal government license. And that year, the Neiman Marcus Christmas catalog was selling uh, like 15 foot satellite dishes for $36,500. None of them sold, but to be fair, that same year, they were also selling blimps. So... Neiman Marcus is fucking ridiculous. By 1980, 2,500 cable systems were carrying HBO, WTCG, PBS, WGN, the Christian Broadcasting Network, Madison Square Garden Channel, C-SPAN, and Showtime. But, okay. This will be important for later, I swear. But we need to talk about some of the technical aspects of this. So the way that satellite worked was you have the station and they beam their program up or the uplink to a satellite that is in geostationary orbit located roughly 22,300 miles over the Earth, like right above the equator. And it's called a fixed satellite system. Each satellite has 24 C-band transponders all set to different frequencies. Ground stations used giant parabolic dishes to send this up, and they were part of a master antenna system 
to uplink the transmission at 5.925 to 6.425 gigahertz and receive or downlink a 3.4 to 4.2 gigahertz connection on the C-band, which ranges from 4 to 8 gigahertz. Initial satellites available for homes were called Television Receive Only or TVRO. And they were called Big Ugly Dishes or BUDS because they were 12 to 16 feet in diameter, made of solid fiberglass, and they had an embedded metal coating. Uh, as technology improved, TVRO models were like 4 to 10 feet in diameter, made of wire mesh and either solid steel or aluminum. The most popular dish size was 10 feet. And this, this is a slight side note that I swear is relevant. I promise. Okay. In 1983, the FCC authorized ComSat and several other companies to offer direct broadcast satellite systems or DBS systems. Uh, essentially, they were small two to three feet wide parabolic dishes on a single satellite feed that distributes channels specifically for a single service, much like Dish Network and DirecTV. Uh, this first system was launched by United Satellite Communications, Inc., and had 50 customers paying $40 a month for five channels in Indianapolis. Yeah. They only got five channels because they were receiving signal on the KU band or the K under band, and that's 14 to 14.5 gigahertz uplink with uh, 10.75 to 11.25 down. And the majority of networks at the time were using C-band. They weren't using the K-under band. And while the service was able to expand to Chicago, Washington, D.C., Cincinnati, and other cities where cable wasn't available, the lack of channels, the cost of $400 to $700 for the dish itself that still picked up a weak signal, the monthly cost all of the everything that was terrible. Uh, they abruptly ended service on April 1st, 1985, when they filed for bankruptcy. They did allow the customers that leased their dish instead of buying their dish to keep them. And outside companies offered to switch it from a KU band to C band at no additional cost. But I digress. When the FCC allowed for satellites to be installed for home use, you could literally buy a satellite build kit that included like all of the maintenance information, how to improve it, like an entire course on how to build and service these satellite dishes, like on your own. Hobbyist magazines posted what channels were using, what frequencies and how to improve. Like they did everything when this started. And it's important to note that because of the initial cost of TVRO systems, roughly $2,000 to $10,000, all of the channels were broadcast in the clear. So there was no encryption. There was no scrambling. If you had a TVRO system on a clear day, chances were you could get programming from up to 150 different broadcasters, including content from subscription services like HBO, backhaul content or wild feed, which would include like unedited syndicated programming, sporting events with no broadcast or commentary, press conferences being recorded for West Coast feeds. Uh, you could get typically blacked out regional sports events. And occasionally you could get things not meant for home viewership, like corporation video conferences or unauthorized shots of the president in the White House after broadcasted statements. That was a thing that happened. It was quite unfortunate. Morning, Ox. So satellite, while pricey, was a one-time cost to gain access to virtually unregulated feeds. While cable subscribers had equipment costs and subscriptions for less content that was highly regulated. This prompted more equipment manufacturers and dealers to pop up, promising the public that they would always get their pay TV for free by making a one-time investment in a satellite signal receiving system. And as a result of that, 500,000 
TVRO systems sold in 1984 alone. Now, this level of access raised a whole bunch of questions. Like, but the two biggest ones were, is it legal for a service provider or copyright holder to encrypt their signals and to what degree to prevent reception? And does receiving the signals of copyrighted and pay TV content apply as unauthorized reception under the Communications Act? And the, the Communications Act of 1934 established the FCC uh, as the regulating body over communications Ooh, excuse me, by radio, television, and wire. And they maintain jurisdiction over the areas of fair competition, radio frequency use, broadband, media responsibility, public safety, and homeland security. And while the FCC had established regulatory rules regarding over-the-air broadcast television and radio stations, there was not an established regulatory authority over broadcast via satellite, and no one knew where all of that like fell into everything. So National League of Cities and the National Cable Television Association negotiated terms starting in 1982. Four voids, two years later, Ronald Reagan passed and signed the Cable Communications Act of 1984. And it clarified that there was a standing between cable and satellite. Uh, the reception of unencrypted signals by a TVRO consumer were legal. It enabled pay TV networks and companies to protect their signals by scrambling or encrypting them and called for pay TV cable companies to allow TVRO consumers the option to purchase access to the encrypted satellite signals, opening them up to fair competition. So it basically regulated satellite to a degree, but it also allowed for cable to become a little less regulated than it was, which is fantastic. And, um, hey, Mindy. Yes, I agree. Screw Reagan. Moving along. Now, because of that, in late 1985, HBO started scrambling their signal for 12 hours a day. And then they announced that they were going to, uh, well, they were just going to do it all the time. If you own a home satellite dish, you may recognize this ah. picture. It's scrambled. 12 hours a day, we scramble the HBO satellite signal. So our programming looks like this, unless it's decoded. On January 15th, 1986, we'll start scrambling 24 hours a day. But your home satellite dish can keep receiving HBO. To find out how, call this number during business hours, 9 to 5 Eastern Time. That's 212-302-6242. So, you know, they made that announcement to everyone. And the pro to this was that HBO, for the first time, was going to invite private dish owners to purchase a decoder and buy the HBO and Cinemax services. The con to this was that they were planning to charge $12.95 a month for either HBO or Cinemax, with both costing $19.95 a month, on top of a $395 charge to buy the Discrambler that was manufactured by MACOM, the people that made their scrambling system. Yeah. Yeah. With the success HBO had in scrambling their signal, Showtime, ESPN, Cable News Network, and others followed suit. So suddenly you have all of these people with giant dishes that they put all of this money into that were useless. Yeah, that's how that worked. So April 27th, 1986, around 12.30 a.m. Eastern, The Falcon and the Snowman, a 1985, sorry, 1985 spy drama movie started airing as usual. Uh, about two minutes in, the signal flickered. And, uh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show y'all what happened. It's fun. 
We'll fast forward that a bit, though. Go. Okay, movie's going as normal. Great. Good morning, Ivy. Tubian. Hey, CT. So for those that may not be looking at the screen, it says, Good evening, HBO, from Captain Midnight. $12.95 a month? No way. Showtime, movie channel, beware. We are learning stuff in themes. Morning, Fit. So that showed for like four minutes just hanging out on the screen. During a movie. So... The hacker, hacker, was 25-year-old electrical engineer and business owner John R. McDougal. Now, McDougal was the owner of a satellite dish and sales installation company, McDougal Electronics. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. Hold on, let me check. Let me double check, really. I had looked it up before. And I did not write it down. <laughs> do, do, do. Mm -hmm. huh. The inflation rate has been uh one hundred seventy two percent. That's crazy. Okay, but where's where's the thingy that I can use to like type it in? You bitches. Yeah, that would be right about thirty bucks. That's ridiculous, you guys. It's not cool. But uh yeah, it is. It's all upcharges. That's all it was. It was upcharge upon upcharge upon upcharge. So he was impacted because he owned this store by the satellite scramble of 1986. He had been selling about seven satellite systems a month that ranged from $2,500 to $4,000 per system. Like, he sold all of those in 1985. Like, that was his monthly thing. But the scramble caused him to only sell one satellite in the first quarter of 1986. So to offset the income that he lost, he took a job at Central Florida Teleport, which was a satellite uplink station for the now-defunct pay-per-view service People's Choice as an operations engineer. Uh... Little known fact, but a week before the Captain Midnight incident, uh, at 12.49 a.m. EST on April 20th, John had actually tested if he could do this. So the color bars he transmitted just by themselves for like a minute and a half or so over the uh, HBO signal. And they didn't investigate it because it happened late at night. Not that many people were watching. It was a very short time. So it just felt like a natural feed cut and it was only reported to the FCC after Captain Midnight had happened. So the night of the signal jamming, McDougal was overseeing the uplink of Pee-wee's Big Adventure. 
And once the movie was over, he had a set procedure he was supposed to follow. The satellite normally sat at at latitude zero, longitude 83. It was pointed at the SATCOM F4 satellite. So what he was supposed to do was he was supposed to turn the satellite dish to the west, placing it at an angle that would allow rainwater to like drain out of the dish and shut it off. That's it. Just turn it to the west very slightly so it's no longer pointed at the satellite. Tilt it. Cut it off. But after Pee-wee's big adventure ended, John swung the satellite over to latitude zero, longitude 134, approximately 3,600 miles west of the SATCOM, and pointed it at the Galaxy One. It was the satellite for Showtime, the movie channel, and HBO. He typed the message using the station's Quanta Corporation Microgym MG100 character generator, set his dish's frequency to the same one used by HBO, which, at the time, not hard to find. Really not hard to find. And he broadcast his message. The broadcast engineer over at the HBO uplink station, like, he tried to regain control by just, like, increasing his power, but John just increased his in return. And the control battle lasted roughly 90 seconds, and the HBO operator was like, okay, we're going to fuck up the satellite. I'm just going to stop and let him have control. And then John was afraid that he would also fuck shit up. So he abandoned control. He turned off his uplink dish and he went home. Like it was just a normal fucking day. The next day, the incident had made its way to the CBS Evening News. And that's because the FCC had started investigating it. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. Especially when you have two massive uplink dishes with a ton of power fighting for control over one transponder on a satellite. Shit was wild. So the Department of Justice indicated to FCC that they wanted to get involved in the case. The FBI was called in to assist 100 FCC field officers and monitoring stations across the U.S. were actively involved. And each of those monitoring stations had no less than six agents working on this case. In order to determine who did it, the FCC compiled a list of every uplink station with enough power to make the transmission, which was roughly 2,000 companies in total. Next, they determined what equipment would be necessary to produce the text and the color bars. Cross-referencing those lists, it cut the list down to like 500. Uh, yes, they did have a literal satellite war. <laughs> so, of those 500 stations... Only 12 were operational and not running other material that night because you can't broadcast from an uplink station and also hijack another thing from that uplink station. That's just not how it works. So after conducting interviews, visiting all 12 stations, McDougal was one of three prime suspects. Now, during the time it took for the FCC to investigate this, McDougal became pretty confident that he wasn't going to get caught, and he had let it slip to a few different people. And something that's always widely talked about whenever they talk about the Captain Midnight hacking is that uh, in May of 1986, someone was heard by a tourist talking about Captain Midnight over a payphone. And the tourists reported it to the FBI with the license plate number of the person that was, like, on the phone. But that little bit of information that people love to talk about is actually highly irrelevant to this case. Because, first of all, they can't decide if it was McDougal himself or a friend of McDougal's. But whoever it was, the FBI, they spoke to them and they, like, weren't cooperating. It literally had no bearing in the case's outcome. So, guys, quit fucking talking about it because it, it's irrelevant. The FCC and everyone else, like, in July, they already had a subpoena. 
Like they already had him down as a prime suspect. They already figured it was probably him and they were working on getting a subpoena. And they got it. He was ordered to appear before a federal grand jury. And that afternoon, on the day that the subpoena was issued, two FCC agents and a deputy U.S. attorney served him. Like, John pled guilty to illegally operating a satellite uplink transmitter, which was a federal misdemeanor after taking a plea deal. And he was sentenced to one year unsupervised probation, given a $5,000 fine, and had his amateur radio license suspended for a year. Uh... Fun fact, he still runs an an electronics store. And, oh, it's so great. He actually does still have, like, the Captain Midnight stuff on his uh, his website. Here, let me show y'all. It's in my list of links. Oh, by the way, uh, after this is all over, I will be putting... uh, my list of sources and everything in the description so that you guys can check out if y'all want to like double check anything but uh yeah look at that it's still on his website to this day and it grew isn't it isn't it great it's so great good job john <laughs> okay so Less than six months after the hijacking happened on October 21st, 1986, Congress passed U.S. Code Title 18, Section 1367, Interference with the Operation of a Satellite, which reads, whoever without the authority of the satellite operator intentionally or maliciously interferes with the authorized operations of communications or weather satellite." or obstructs or hinders any satellite transmission shall be fined in accordance with this title or imprisoned for not more than 10 years or both. Uh, The fine in this case being up to $100,000 and would make what John did a felony, a federal felony. Uh, Generally, laws do not pass that quickly. But the fact that this one passed that quickly was because it really was a matter of security because at the time FCC's satellite communications expert stated in an interview that there's no way for a satellite to tell the difference between a wanted signal and an unwanted signal. There's no commercially feasible way to block out unwanted signals. When it comes to gaining control of satellite transmissions, it's about power and location. The signal with the greatest amount of power blocks out any others. But if two signals are the same in terms of power, the one sent from the point closest to the satellite will prevail. So even though HBO's uplink was fighting to regain power, John's uplink station was closer to the satellite. And the Galaxy X, the Galaxy 1 satellite carried HBO on Transponder 23 at a rate of 125 watts with relay signals sent out at 6.385 gigahertz. Knowing that the uplink dish John had control of could match that power, he could have potentially taken over three additional satellites. The Telstar 301 satellite operated by AT&T tuned at 6.065 gigahertz airing the network feed of CBS. Over at 72 West Longitude, not that far from his own satellite, he could have ca- <coughs> my bad. He could have taken control of the foreign language feed of the Voice of America network, which was the oldest and longest running U.S. owned international radio broadcast. Had he set the dish to 100 degrees West Longitude at a frequency of 293.375 megahertz he could have jammed the signal of the United States Navy satellite Fleet Satcom 1. So, yeah, it it was a matter of national security, really. Mm. No, Slim, satellites cannot give consent. Poor things. Now, with how publicized, heavily investigated, and how quickly a new law was passed, 
because of the Captain Midnight intrusion, you'd think that this sort of thing wouldn't happen for a long time, but it happened again a little more than a year later. <laughs> so, September 6th, 1987, the movie Three Daughters was airing on the Playboy channel. The movie was then interrupted with a text-only message. And I have a picture of that signal intrusion. The video itself will never see the light of day, but uh, Dr. Marcus Michael, brilliant man that he is, stop it, he, uh, he had a picture of it on his website. He was the FCC investigator involved in these cases. So, the text read, Thus saith the Lord thy God, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And those come from uh, Exodus 28 and Matthew 4, 17. So, the team that investigated Captain Midnight also investigated this one. And the religious content of the transmission made the Christian Broadcasting Network a suspect, but it was the rest of the investigation that did confirm it. Um, on the date of the interference, there were 370 stations with an antenna large enough to generate the signal necessary to cause an interference. Only 178 of those were capable of video transmission. The FCC was able to determine that the message had been generated on a Knox Products K50 character generator. And of the 178 possible stations, only six used that specific one. So something that was noted in the trial was that uh, the interference, when they reviewed the tape that was taken from the Playboy Uplink Center, uh, it was marked by fuzziness at the beginning, which lasted 1.67 seconds. This was the result of the transmitter responsible for the interference starting at low power and then shifting into a full power mode. This is a specific characteristic of Varian Gen 2 transmitters. And of the six stations, the, CB, the CBN ground station of Virginia Beach, Virginia, was the only one with the Varian Gen 2, and Thomas Haney was the only engineer working at the station that night. So, during the course of the entire investigation, there was never any evidence that anyone else at CBN was involved in the planning or execution of it. CBN staffers gave false and misleading statements to hinder the investigation. Some even attempted to destroy evidence. Pat Robertson, owner of CBN, paid Haney's lawyer fees, $300,000 roughly, through their like missions and charitable donations. But yeah, Pat Robertson paid for it. So... While this investigation ended in 1987, it was easy, but it still took about the same amount of time that it took to investigate Captain Midnight. So the case for Thomas Haney actually did not go to jury trial until 1990, and no information about the investigation leaked until around that time. And this was very likely due in part to uh, Pat Robertson running against the first Bush for the Republican ballot, making it a political hot potato. Hey, Afro-humanist. Uh, yeah, it's very likely that now it would only distort the signal. Um, but that also has to do with the fact that they switched bands most networks have switched over to the KU band now. And then you also have to consider the fact that uh, the vast majority of channels don't use the very high frequency feeds anymore. They go for ultra high frequency um, because of the switch from analog, really. They switched over to ultra high frequencies, but we'll talk about that later. So, when the case did go to trial, Dino McCann 
a CBN spokesman claimed that the FCC investigation was flawed, stating that they hired an outside satellite expert to duplicate it, but they couldn't. And they tried to claim that the FCC couldn't duplicate it either, but that was not the case because they did try and duplicate the fuzziness to prove that it was in fact that generator. And they did. They were very successful in that. Dino's just stupid. Let's see. What's that? There it is. Oh. So after a jury trial took place, uh, Haney was convicted on two charges. One felony count of interfering with the operation of a satellite and one misdemeanor count of violating a radio license. Now, they tried to get him for a similar thing that happened on the Exodus channel, but there was just a lack of evidence, so they couldn't. But uh, he did file an appeal. He did want to get that appeal. Uh, actually, I have that appeal. Or at least the result of that appeal. There we go. There it is. See? So when he filed the appeal, he challenged the court's denial of his timely motions for judgment of acquittal, contending that the impermissible hearsay testimony was introduced at trial, and he challenged the denial of his motion to require the government to elect between charges. Uh, it was determined in the appeal that the government's case was technical and circumstantial. Testimony provided by FCC Chief of Aviation and Marine Branch George Dillon, FCC Assistant Bureau Chief of Field Operations Bureau, and the expert witness in signal analysis and identification, Dr. Marcus Michael, and the designer of the Knox K-50 himself were not hearsay and were admissible. Thus, the charges were upheld, and he received three years of probation, a $1,000 fine, and 150 hours of community service. And I swear, all of this information is highly relevant because all of these people investigated the next thing that happened, the next incident. And all of this information was available to the public. So people knew, and it plays into the, the last incidents that happened. So before we talk about the Max Headroom incident, let me tell you who Max Headroom is, okay? Because like, oh my God, people don't realize just how popular- Oh no, wrong button. People don't realize just how popular Max Headroom himself was. So let me switch that because I fucked that up. There we go. Uh -huh. Okay. My bad. So in the early 1980s, with the rise of MTV in the States, Peter Wagg, creative services head for Chrysalis Records at the time, approached Andy Park, commissioning editor for music at Channel 4, which was a new TV channel in the UK, about trying to develop a music video show for Channel 4. Uh, Wagg, when trying to figure out a direction for the music show, didn't want to go the same route as MTV. They were using the VJs, real people introducing and linking the music videos, he decided that maybe the host for their show didn't need to be a real person. And so he got George Stone to help him. George Stone was a writer, radio producer, commercial maker for an ad agency. And while he had a number of clients that were record companies, he always was interested in what he called the landscape of television. When developing the name for the show, they had a list of about 40 different names with Max Hedrum as one of them. Ultimately, it won out and... George Stone really didn't know why he put Max Headroom on the list, but, you know. Uh, Peter Wagg gave the explanation that it was maximum headroom. It's all vision. It's all sound. It's filling your head full of it. And the joke about maximum headroom comes from a very specific firm that specialized in car parks in the UK or parking garages here. 
and their height restriction sign would say max headroom instead of maximum height. So George Stone claims that because of the Max Headroom character, National Car Parks spent about three million pounds to change all of their signage to read maximum height. But there's like no source for that. There's just, I think it's just urban legend. <laughs> so Rocky Morton and Annabelle Jenkel were brought on to the project with Cucumber Studios, and they animated Elvis Costello's Accidents Will Happen video and Tom Tom Club's Genius of Love. Uh, Rocky felt that the bits of graphics trying to link together unrelated but incredible music videos was just not interesting. So he leaned into the idea of boring. What's the most, quote, what's the most boring thing I could do to just annoy everybody? And the most boring thing that I could think of to do, which would really go against the grain for the MTV generation, was a talking head, a middle-class white male in a suit talking to them in a really boring way about music videos, end quote. Uh, Rocky approached jo George Stone with the idea of Max being computer generated, and from there, this entire backstory about Max Headroom came to fruition. The idea for Max was that he had already had a show as a real person. He was running late and he was rushing around and he was in an open top sports car and he crashed through the barrier of a car park and was knocked into a coma. In order to get him on the air that night, they had to like download his brain and reconstitute him as a computer model of himself and put him on air. So you would have like the total amnesiac whose first exposure to the world is 300 or 30,000 simultaneous channels of television. And he's supposed to be a fusion of everything you see on TV. And from his perspective, there's no distinguishing between like any one person. So they pitched this idea to Peter Wag, and he was just like, no, Channel 4 is not going to like it. Not at all. So Rocky was like, okay, I'll pitch it to them. And they loved it. They absolutely loved the idea. But instead of having Max just host the 13 half-hour shows that they had already ordered, they were like, hey, we're going to make a TV movie. Well, we want you to make a TV movie to set up this backstory leading into the music video show. But the issue is Peter Wag was only given a budget for 13 half-hour episodes and was not given a budget to make a fucking movie. So... Uh, at the time, because mind you, this was 1980, early 1980s, HBO had just launched uh, Cinemax, like a couple years before this. And so to help fund the Max Headroom project, Peter Wagg pitched the idea to Bridget Porter, who was the original programming vice president of HBO. Bridget loved the idea for Cinemax. Uh, she thought it was edgy and unusual and was a great fit as one of, like, the first original programs for Cinemax. So they decided that they wanted to be involved. They wanted to fund the Max Headroom origin film, and they wanted to have seasons aired here in the U.S. So uh, Matt Frewer got called in to audition for the role of Max Hedrum after Annabelle noticed his Polaroid because he had very, very defined features and she thought that his face was perfect for it. So he was supposed to do like a 10 minute improv as Max Hedrum for his audition. And one of the prosthetics designer knew Max, knew Matt was perfect for the role of Max because when he listened to the audition tape, he couldn't hear him at all. All he could hear was the laughter from Rocky, Annabelle, and Peter. So, media pick. On April 4th, 1985, during the very lucrative movie of the week spot for uh, Channel 4, Max Headroom, 20 minutes into the future, aired. Two days later, on April 6th, 1985, the Max Headroom show premiered at 6 p.m. on Channel 4. And the thing was, Max's show was different from everything else that had been on Channel 4 because you didn't get an introduction to the show. 
it literally just did this. And now on for... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I bet you do, Harry. <laughs> yeah, you too. <laughs> oh, just chatting away to Harry back there. As a matter of fact, you might be interested in this too. too, too, too. too, too. Like, that's, that's literally how his show would start. And he was such a hit that within three weeks of airing, viewership on Channel 4 had doubled. Uh, Matt Frewer wasn't allowed to reveal that he was Max Hedrum to keep the illusion with the prosthetics, editing, and acting that he was computer animated. Uh, and actually, the pilot for the for the show won a BAFTA. It they shouldn't have won this BAFTA. Because they won it for graphics. And there were no graphics. Like the only graphic that happened on Max Headroom was the the lines behind him. That's it. Everything else was just editing and Matt being great at what he's doing. But yeah, look at that. 1986. Graphics. Why? There were none. But okay. Any hoozle. So while well, season one never aired here in the US, uh, Cinemax did get first run for the revamped season two. It put Max in like a barroom setting and had him interacting with guests. Guests that season were Sting, Simon LeBon, Nick Rhodes of Duran Duran, Roger Daltrey, and Boy George. Uh, in the U.S., it ran from November to December of 1985. And in the U.K., it ran from July to August 1986. Season three of the Max Headroom show was revamped again and saw Max in a larger talk show set with every episode having a guest and Max interacting with the audience as well. Guests for this season were Michael Caine, Vidal Sassoon, Oliver Reed, Tracy Ullman, Rutger Hauer, David, David Byrne, sorry, Howie Mandel, Jack Lemon, uh, Jackson Brown, and Jackie Collins. And the U.S. got first run for the season as well, airing from 1986, uh, August 1986 until December 1986. Uh, December 18th, 1986, Max Hedrum's Giant Christmas Turkey Special aired in the U.S. It was written by George R.R. R. Martin, yes, the Game of Thrones guy, and featured guests Dave Emmons, Bob Geldof, Robin Williams, and Tina Turner. So, like, he was huge. He had all of these very famous people that just wanted to be a part of his show. He had all of the everything going for him at the time. And the Christmas special aired in the UK the day after Christmas. Oh, hey, Melissa. Hey, August. Lovely to see y'all. Yeah. Yeah, they they thought that he was indeed real. It's, he, oh my God, he rose to fame very fucking quick. So... The Christmas special aired in the UK the day after Christmas and acted as a lead-in to season three for UK viewers. And the season aired from January to March, 1987. Uh, in early 1987, ABC picked up like a dramatic version of Max Headroom for a mid-season replacement. And it aired from March 31st until May 5th. And it did well enough to be picked up for a full fall season. Basic straps. Ace. Ice kids. So, uh, following the end of season three of the Max Headroom show in the UK, Channel 4 decided that they were done with it. So, they ended their run. Uh, Cinemax picked up six more episodes of Max Headroom under the name The Original Max Talking Headroom Show to air every two weeks leading into the full ABC fall season. Uh, guests for the six-episode run were Jerry Hall, Penn and Teller, Mary Tyler Moore, Robin Leach, Ron Reagan Jr., 
Paul Schaefer, Dr. Ruth, Bobby McFerrin, Don King, Emo Phillips, Madeline Tan, William Shatner, Grace Jones, and Gilbert Godfrey. And they ran from July 23rd until October 1st, with season two of ABC's drama series starting on September 18th and ending October 16th. Two weeks after the Cinemax series ended, they decided that they were done with it. ABC canceled Max Headroom after only airing five of the episodes intended for the season's original run. And while he was doing his run, and even immediately after for a moment, he was everywhere. Oh my gosh. So he was doing radio rental ads in the UK in 1985. I don't get why. Hi there, televisionists. I'm here to warn you about video nasties. And what could be nastier than your video going on the blink? blink, 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 blink. This could be <laughs> bad news if you buy a video, but no problem if you rent one from <gasps> Radio Rentals. We'll sort you out in a jiffy. And no video Wait. nasty. So he did Radio Rentals. He did. He was the uh, he was the new Coke spokesman from 1985 into 1987, which is where a lot of people know him because during his time that he was on a uh, Cinemax, they actually like Cinemax was a pay network. A lot of people didn't have it, so their only interaction with Max Headroom was when he was like on David Letterman when he was doing the co commercials. Yes, Sydney. He absolutely was. Let it load first. Don't poop out on me, internet. Yes, I believe. No. Wait a minute. Sorry, you guys. I'm having technical problems this morning. I'm having all the problems this morning. New Coke is catching on. The taste is better and newer than. You said the P word. So, what I want to know is if you're drinking Coke, who's drinking Pepsi? If you can't beat it, that's the way. Coke. So yeah, he was he was the spokesman for New Coke. Uh, in 1986, he was in music video for the band Art of Noise. He was also doing interviews on Letterman. He he was everywhere. He was literally everywhere. Uh, yes, New Coke was a massive failure. But yeah, see? There he is. He's just... Look, I must have a star on my door. Or better still. A door, a door. So yeah, he all over the place. But like I I know that there was a lot of like background information for Max Headroom, pop culture, cult icon extraordinaire, but his history is kind of important because roughly two months after or no, not even two months. It was roughly a month after he was canceled on ABC that the Max Hedrum incidents happened. We're going to get to that. I have a lot of information to give you all. So, also, hi, Bum. I see you. <laughs> all right. So, November 22nd, 1987. Uh, the 
WGN in Chicago was airing their nine o'clock news. They were doing a sports report. And this is how that went. Son got a good break on it. Unfortunately enough, we scored. Then they scored again at the Lions 31. Wayne Larravee called it like this on WGN Radio. Two yard line and McMahon back to throw. Dumps it up the middle. Wide open the cut. Cutting left to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown! McMahon and McKinnon 14 0 Bears. Then the defense, which hadn't put up a sack in 12 quarters, finally did. Well, if you're wondering what's happened, <laughs> so am I. Actually, the computer that we have running our news from time to time took off and went wild. So what we're going to do is start over from the top of the Bears and tell you once again about the 30 to 10 victory they had over Detroit today out at Soldier Field. We'll show you from the top and show you again the change that they made today on defense with Maurice Douglas as the nickel back. He made a great play, one of his first chances, and uh, of course, two to one. So the Hawks need a comeback tonight. Out at the state. Oh, good, huh? Very good. A lot, a lot of good action. sports action today, huh? <laughs> Twice, some of it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Boom. You liked Thank it so you. much that you really planned that, didn't you? Sure, I did. Okay, <laughs> Dan. My bad. So, like I said, big shout out to the Max Headroom Signal Hijacking channel. Wonderful channel. Got a lot of these videos from them. Uh, I put their link in the chat. But, so the sports reporter that was doing his thing, he was just to fill in that night. Like, he was not supposed to be there, really. Like, could have been anywhere else. But <laughs> the thing is, when he said, if you're wondering what happened, so am I. It's because at the time they didn't have a live feed of the broadcast inside of the studio. So all he heard in his ear was, hey, we lost signal. We're working to get it back. We'll let you know. And then suddenly he heard in his ear, okay, we're about to be live again in three, two, one. And there he was. So he didn't know. He actually didn't find out until the next day exactly what had happened when he saw his news report on national news. Oh, hello, hello, Dita. Lovely to see you. Hey, j -Man. So he didn't know. He had no clue. So the next incident actually happened a little after 11 o'clock during an airing of Doctor Who. Now, that first video, it's incredible that someone had it because the actual news broadcast itself for WGN, they, they locked that tape up. Like, as soon as it happened, as soon as anything happened, they locked it up. They did not let anyone get their hands on it until they sent it over to the FBI. Yes, it is. So the fact that someone, for some reason, was recording the news that night, absolutely incredible. Otherwise, we would not be able to see that. So second incident happened on WTTW during Doctor Who. And Doctor Who fans at the time were, you know, always recording the episodes. So, of course, we have tape You should of it. walk up and with the old ones of your tribe. That is the only way to learn. I'll get you a hot drink, miss. Why oh, don't you try clothes? Because it's a freaking nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm better than Chuck's worst in it. Working with her. Oh, Jesus. Oh, what a nerd. Oh, 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 o
I can tell a massive electric shock, he died instantly. The generator? Are you always so careful? So, that was the second incident. <laughs> okay. Now, the thing about it is, uh, a lot of people have reported on this before and they've been like, oh, there was no one at Sears Tower, which is where the broadcasting tower for. Uh, OK, the third we're going to talk about this one in a moment. Don't worry. Um, OK, so. When people write about this, when people like do streams about this and stuff they always tend to mention that there was no one working at the sears tower it would not matter if someone was working at the sears tower or not what matters is the fact that wttw did not have any engineers at the location that night wttw because they were pbs because they received these tapes all they have to do at night is just have a mastercard holder that Plays the tapes. That's it. That's all they do. So no engineer there. No way to stop the signal. But we'll get into that. So uh, this third hacking was not a real one. As you can see, excuse me, right here it says pre-recorded. You'll, it, it's so fake it hurts you guys. Say the Bears will win? Yeah, say win big. I don't know. They haven't been able to cover for most of the year. The Bears today were made 12-point favorites over the Packers. Randy Wright should start at quarterback for Green Bay. Jimbo Covert will likely join Jay Hilgenberg in wearing one of those shoulder harnesses. They ought to just yoke the whole offensive line together. They'd be better off. In the meantime, Dennis McKinnon had some advice for fellow receivers Willie Galt and Ron Morris today. Speaking at the uh, lunch crowd at Ditka's, McKinnon said, you want to play for Mike, you got to do more than just go out there and look pretty catching touchdown passes. You have to understand how Mike is. Mike doesn't say much when you, you play well. But when you start making mistakes, he has a tendency to get a little heated. I think uh, basically Sonny and Ron missed a few blocks that ordinarily he should have made. It was just mental mental block, actually, what it was. Um, but you can't do that too often. I think you have to recall a few years ago, Willie, ba Willie Galt didn't block anybody. Yeah. All of a sudden, he's the greatest blocker of all time. <laughs> all right. Dennis also ripped his own teammates on defense. In college basketball tonight, Purdue and Iowa State were going at it. And the Boilers, you know, they got ambushed. They were rated like the number two team of the nation in preseason early on. Evanston's own Everett Stevens. Double now, see, punch. this very he fake pre-recorded stuff. Uh -oh. Like, they Troy ended Lewis up getting, like, multiple, multiple phone three calls point about it. Howitzer, but... but Purdue just couldn't stop the Cyclones' <sighs> Jeff Grayer. He led everybody with 28. Iowa State stings Purdue for the last night. So, these incidents happen. They, <laughs> they were very heavily reported on the next day. One thing that I absolutely hate about the way that this was reported was that they kept changing the title for the engineers at the stations and they couldn't decide on how to spell one guy's name. Like the guy that was the head engineer and vice president for WTTW, they spelled his name so wrong all the time, 
all the time. I hate it. I hate it. It annoys the shit out of me. But we're going to watch the news reports because they're, they're important. Tonight it happened twice to two different Chicago television stations. Someone using sophisticated equipment managed to briefly and illegally override broadcast signals on WGN-TV and WTTW. Jack Kennedy reports now that both incidents are under investigation. Even in a medium that is no stranger to bizarre moments, these were truly bizarre. Starting first on WGN-TV at 9.14 Sunday night, during a sports cast. 12 quarters finally did. Take some pretty sophisticated uh, microwave equipment operating in the broadcast uh, auxiliary frequency bands and, uh, and a significant amount of power. About two hours later, the video pirate struck again. This time, the target was a science fiction broadcast on PBS affiliate WTTW. And this time, it wasn't 25 seconds long. It ran for almost a minute and a half. By this time, the pirate had managed to insert audio as well, along with a display of a marital aid and a portion of his or her anatomy. It generated hundreds of calls really kind of expressing uh, sympathy over the fact uh, that uh, our signal would be interfered with this in this way and that it would inconvenience so many thousands of our viewers. The incidents are now under investigation by the FCC and the FBI. But the odds, I'd say, if a guy continues to involve himself, either sporadically or continuously, uh, it's very great that we will determine who it is. All early evidence points to someone with a broadcasting background. Someone who really knows the business and uh, microwave in general. But the person in the Max Headroom disguise may not know how sophisticated officials can be in tracing this sort of thing. It leaves an electronic signature. And while it may have been a stunt, it is not treated as a joke. Chicago's video pirate could face a jail sentence and fines for his freelance exercise in public access. Jack Connerty, Fox 32 News. Tonight is trying to find out who's responsible. Now, see, we're going to get to that. We are. Because uh, it's it's actually really interesting, in my opinion. So. Well, for two acts of video piracy. Last night, someone broke into regular programming here on Channel 9 and on Chicago's public broadcasting station. As Larry Roderick reports, the first interruption took place during last night's 9 o'clock news. <laughs> It was not that deep, I promise. Sports anchor Dan Rowan had just started his Sunday night Bears report when the screen suddenly went black, then came back on with a new unruly presence, a man wearing a Max Headroom mask. We have been taken over by a video... God damn it, Sydney! don't give away your secrets! Until technicians here changed microwave channels between the studio and the transmitter and knocked him off the air. And apparently somebody... Uh, with some microwave equipment was able to interfere with our signal going to the uh, Hancock transmitter. Well, this is not just anybody off the street. He has to have an electronic expertise of some level, right? Yes, he does. It takes very sophisticated equipment to uh, to do this at a significant power level. So this isn't uh, something that just anyone would be able to uh, to accomplish. But Channel 9 was... That's important. See... Uh... It's actually, it's actually interesting that they keep saying that it had to be someone with insider knowledge. Um, so I'm sure that everyone knows about the fucking Reddit thread. The ask me anything about, uh, I think I know who did the Max Hedgeroom incident. That shit. Uh, they, of course, backtracked on it two years later. And when they did that backtrack, they were like, oh, yes, we spoke to all of these people that you know, worked in the industry and they were like, yes, you had to have this massive knowledge. It had to have been an inside job. There's no other way. That's bullshit. It is. It, it's, com it's complete bullshit. I'm going to tell you what. So, exactly, Adita. It is not that sophisticated. So, okay. I have gone through all of the interviews. I have read all of the themes. I have learned about how fucking satellites work. So 
I mentioned earlier that, well, I mentioned earlier that uh, in Chicago, around this time, there was a direct-to-broadcast system that failed. So all of these people had these satellite dishes just lying around. You also had people that purchased these giant parabolic satellites so that they could do things that were suddenly unusable. You had hobbyist magazines that could tell you how to alter and change things. It did not have to be an inside job. You simply just had to have access to the tools, which they did. That's it. It's that simple. So I did not mean to bring that back up. Oops. <laughs> so, okay. I do have a quote here from the head engineer of WTTW, uh, Larry Oker. Yeah. No, no. I think he was like in a different country at the time. <laughs> so, uh, quote, to do it, they had to be stationed between our broadcast location studio there on Bradley Place in Chicago and our transmitter downtown. So they had to get in between there somehow and break into the signal. I thought the funny thing about it was, as far as I remember, there was only one copy of the actual off air and it was immediately locked into the news director's office into a cabinet and no one saw it. The YouTube video of it is somebody who just happened to be taping the news that night for some reason. Oh wait, this is Dan Roan, my bad, sorry. WG and anchor during the incident. Sorry, on a VHS machine and got what he got. So Dan understood, Dan, the news anchor, understood that in order for them to be able to get the signal, they had to be in between it. Now, Bradley Place was roughly six miles away from John Hancock, which is where their tower was. That's where their transmission went to. WTTW was about five miles away from WGN, and theirs was at Sears Tower. So they were about 11, 12 miles away from Sears Tower. Sears Tower, John Hancock, not that far away from each other. It's like two miles. So for WGN, being that they were closer to their tower they were able to stop the signal faster because all they had to do was just change their frequency. And like I said before, when you're transmitting, it does not matter if you are matching power. If you are closer to that tower, you will take over that signal. Your signal will win out. It works the same way with the satellite transmissions. So, what they do believe, what they know, what the FCC figured out from their investigation was that all they needed to do was be at a high rise in between John Hancock and Sears Tower. And they just had to be able to set the frequency right and break that signal. Guess what, you guys? Uh, the signals for those channels they're well known. Everyone knows them. They are something that have been the same for decades. Aww. So channel two goes for 54 megahertz for like the low end. And the upper end is 60. This is megahertz. Just megahertz. So channel nine is on very high frequency as well because none of the local channels used ultra high frequencies. And channel nine, the low end was 186 and the upper was 192. Channel 11 is 198. Their upper was 204. This is easy to find information. So you have satellites that work in gigahertz. Satellites that you could very easily alter. 
I don't know why everyone thinks that this was an inside job. It's not. It's not. The FCC says it's not too. By the way. I actually have those quotes. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, yeah. See, you swear that, but, you know, you've been so interested in the information that I have. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, I don't know why people don't understand that. Like, I don't know. But anyway... So, when the hacks happened, uh, one of the things that they did, because, you know, at the time, it was, yes, it was the cyborgs. It was the cyborgs. Sorry, guys. <sighs> Any hoozle. <laughs> so, when this happened, like, everyone was afraid that it was an inside thing. Everyone was all about it being an inside thing. Uh, a guy named Al that worked for WTTW as one of their engineers reported that the day after the intrusion, he had discussions with his union, maintenance staff, and with the director of engineering. And by 9 a.m., they had sent the first record of complaint to the FCC. Everyone was on edge. Everyone was concerned that it may be something going on, you know? Uh, Jim Higgins was one of the investigators on the Max Hedrum case. He was also an investigator for Captain Midnight and an investigator for the Playboy Channel hack. So what he said was, I've investigated things from stuck radio microphones on vessels to people intentionally jamming the police and swearing at them with stolen or police radios or clock radios that accidentally generate a signal that interferes with something else nearby. I was working on various things, inspecting television stations, special projects, studying interference to Voice of America, and the Max Hedrum incident popped up. In my view, those people who continue to bring it up and ask questions about it and post questions about it were either involved or know who was involved in the incident. The criminals always, you know, they're proud of their achievements. They want people to remember. That's my theory anyway. So maybe someday someone will make an admission. But for now, we don't know. And Dr. Marcus Michaels, he said that they had a lead. They had an idea. They had, like, this... This full-on, okay, we, we have a location... We recognize this door. We can see all of this. We can go there. But by the time they were able to do anything, uh, the Chicago office of the FCC was not, like, cooperating. So... So, Jim Higgins... Absolutely thinks that, you know, everyone that posts about it online did it. But the most plausible theory comes from Al of WTTW. My real suspicion is this was not a vicious intentional act. It was the act of a couple of people drinking beer in back of somebody's garage going, you know, if we could do this. I've got this piece of equipment over there, and I know this guy has got a dish over here, and maybe for a case of beer, we can get this all together and do something. That's the way I think it really happened. Oh. Bye, Dita. Have a good day. Bye, Ivy. See? The, the most plausible theory that there is to this day, I don't care what anyone says, is that it was a bunch of people that were drinking or doing drugs and were like, hey, we should try this. Because it's not like you couldn't find the information you needed. It's not like you couldn't 
find hobbyist magazines to help you alter things. It's not like you didn't have access to these satellites. They were already around. They were already lying around for anyone to use. Someone's going to have the equipment. Someone's going to have the various pieces that you need of the equipment. It's just a matter of getting it all together. Uh, Chuck Swirsky, <laughs> uh, he actually was not happy that his name got brought up by the uh, Max Hedrum guy because he got a whole bunch of phone calls from like family and friends and they were just like, uh, have you seen this? Why, why did he bring you up? Why did he mention your name? Because it, we don't know. Oh, he was the main sportscaster for WGN. He just happened to not be on air that night. Dan was filling in for him. <laughs> yeah. So whoever it was, was a local who knew the sportscasters, who was just picking on WGN because they could. Because they did mention, like, the guy did say in the second broadcast that uh, he was going to make a treat for the world's greatest newspaper dorks. WGN stands for Takers world's the greatest newspaper. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. He's just, he's picking on Chuck Swirsky. Because <laughs> he can he brings up a whole bunch of references to like new Coke, all the things. Now, something that uh, I'm uh, who I don't know. Okay, so do 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 do. There it is. Yeah. Oh, I guess they're a giant masterpiece for all the greatest world newspaper nerds. <laughs> oh. My brother is wearing the other one. Yeah. But when the FCC was investigating this, something that uh, they noticed was in this moment. I, I had to put his ass on screen, sorry, yes. But uh, you have this background. And this was very clearly like a roll-up door. So they were able to figure out kind of where it happened. But it, it never got any further than that. And uh, Dr. Marcus Michaels, when interviewed about it, said Max Hedrum wasn't a danger to public safety or to a multi-million piece of equipment, so the resources were a lot less. They had a lot less to work with to investigate this incident. He did not make the door spin. That door is stationary right there, but what they had was they had a piece of metal that looks similar that's uh, that they were able to move around in the background. That's all. Just an extra piece of metal. It, it's all very basic stuff that people had lying around. Like, it's it's not this big, huge conspiracy. And the thing is, we're 30 years out from this, right? Like, it, no one's going to know who did it. No one is. No one's going to come forward. Uh, quote, in the radio world, a lot of strange things happen, and you can do weird things once and probably get away with it. If you do it multiple times, there's more of a chance you'll be caught, and we haven't seen this guy for over 20 years. End quote. Dr. Michael Marcus. Dr. Marcus Michael. God dang. I cannot get my words right today. But yeah. Uh the Department of Justice has been asked recently about the Max Hedrum case, but they 
don't want to answer. They like refuse to answer. Uh, but according to the criminal resource manual, uh, in section 650 length of limitations periods, current federal law contains a single statute prescribing a general period of limitations, as well as several statutes that provide longer periods for specific offenses. Yeah, there you go. Corrugated steel. That's one. Thank you. Uh, so the statute of general applications is U.S. Code Title 18, Section 3282, which is offenses not capital, Part A in general. Except as otherwise expressly provided by law, no person shall be prosecuted, tried, or punished for any offense not capital unless the indictment is found or the information is instituted within five years next after such offense shall have been committed. Because there is no, like, set statute of limitations for the, for a U.S. Title 18, 1327, I think it was, uh, because there is no set statute there, they only had five years. If someone comes forward now, they cannot be tried for what they did. Granted, at the time, they were like, oh, if we catch them, we're also going to try them for uh, indecency because you're not allowed to do this on TV. <laughs> Hey, Jay Choi. Hey, Blaine. <laughs> so, this entire big mystery is only really a mystery as to will they ever come forward and say that they did it. Wasn't an inside job. Wasn't anything big and special. It just happened to happen. And we do not have the first 13 seconds of audio that came from the first transmission. And that is likely due in part to the fact that uh, they just, they didn't have the audio frequency right. Because, I get, I looked all this up. Uh -huh. So, when it comes to those channels, they do have a very set frequency that their audio comes in on. Uh, for channel... For channel 9, it's uh, 191.75, and for channel 11, it's 203.75 megahertz. So they just, they didn't have that frequency set right. That's all it was. And they could have taken over any other channels. They really could have. Because, you know, you had all of the local channels just right there on those towers could have taken over any single one of them i'm thinking that it was just easiest to set it to those frequencies and they had a stroke of luck that's all oh we happened to get into this one and it worked and then because of the distance between wttw and the tower they were closer so they just kept it wgn could kick them off WTTW could not. Yeah. That's literally all it was. You guys. It's not that serious. I do not. I do not think that they got cold feet after. Uh, yeah. The, okay. So. You weren't here earlier for this part. Uh. After the Captain Midnight Signal broadcast hijacking of HBO, uh, they passed a law, Code Title 18, Section 1367, my bad, uh, interference with the operation of a satellite, and uh, it calls for jail time of no more than 10 years or a fine up to $100,000 or both. So... It's not really a lot of jail time, per se. But I don't think they got cold feet. 
I think they did exactly what they wanted to do. They figured out how to hijack a signal. They hung out. They did their thing. And they left. Exactly. They, well, they don't, uh, I don't think they pretend it's a terrifying video. I think that they like to pretend that uh, it's a lot deeper than it is. They like to pretend that it was this big inside job and someone from the studio totally did it. No, it, it, college kids dicking around. I mean, it's, it's so simple. Uh, let's see. If anyone would like to come in, ask questions, talk about this, there's a link in the chat. We've got like a couple hours, so. Everyone wants to know who did it. But I agree with uh, Jim Higgins of the FCC. Like, the people that post about it the most online very likely did it. Very likely. Oh, let me show y'all that Reddit thread, actually. Because I hate it. I do. I'm not afraid to say that I absolutely hate this fucking Reddit thread. Do. I'd love to know who did it. I would. Oh no, I almost accidentally blocked myself. <laughs> I am not smart. Okay, let's see. Okay, so. Yeah, I, I, I do want to know who did it. I really do. I do. It does enhance the experience a lot. And one thing that a lot of people uh, are taken back by is the fact that, you know, they were able to pull it off and then just disappear into the night. But again, uh, Dr. Marcus Michael did say that, you know, it, he wasn't a threat. He was, he did something very innocent, really, besides the ass smacking, but, you know. So, this is the thread where uh, he backtracked on, like, everything. Do, 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 do. And pull up his first thread. Oh my goodness. I would love to know who did it. Like, I, I can't get over that. Who done it? Oh yeah, let me pin that comment with the fucking link. Mm -hmm. I can get it to go. Okay, so. There it is. I found it. 
because I did not put this one in my source links because uh, uh, it's bullshit. I'm not in the source links. I did not. Uh, I was not alive <laughs> when this happened. So, not a thing. So, when he published this thread, this was 12 years ago that he did. Okay. Uh, and then four years later, he backtracked. But he went into so much detail. No, it was not. About these two people named J and K, and he goes, he like, is very, <sighs> he's kind of a dick about one of them that is, you know, autistic. So, kind of live in an era where mysteries are dying off. The internet has made these things so, so much easier to solve. Like, hell, we even know what happened to Amelia Earhart now. It's fascinating. And it makes the mysteries that stay mysteries more fascinating, too. Yeah, it does. And uh, actually, we. They recently solved the case of a man that was found washed up on a, or sitting on a beach in Australia. Uh, they finally, like, got him identified. So, did anyone try hijacking broadcasts in the 90s? Uh, actually, I have a list of things. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I don't have any listed out for the 90s, although there likely were. Uh, I have, like, major ones that were done. And those go from 2006 up until 2016. But some of these are, like, overseas. Uh, you've got a lot of ones that happened on a, on cable, actually. Yeah, it is fantastic. Uh, dude had been unidentified since 1940s, I do believe. So, yeah. But, yeah. So, yeah, he refers to Jay as having a fairly severe autism and coming off as basically crazy, which tells me that you know nothing about how autism actually works and you should shut your fucking mouth. Anyway, so you see how long this is, right? You see how much detail he put into this. And then he backtracked. And says that it was most definitely not. And Vice actually did cover this before. Uh, a lot of people have, but they don't use the most updated information because the most recent interviews for this were actually done in 2020. So two years ago. I have those. Those are... Where are you? I have you. Uh huh. Here it is. Yeah. Uh, the criminal podcast. I will actually put this link inside of the chat so that you can go listen to it because it is full of a ton of information and. 
one of the things that was actually brought up in that was they talked to the guy that was Max Hedger. They actually got his opinion on it. And he said that, like, oh, here it is. Quote, it was very surreal and flattering. And in a way, I kind of expected, you know, that Max being the subversive character that he was, and he was born of a hacker, why not? And a hacker would use them and in a subversive way. And in a lot of ways, it was very flattering because Max himself is the kind of the ultimate sapphire because he's Mr. TV. He's on a TV and it's about a TV network. So I guess it makes perfect sense that he would be used as a tool of something subversive, you know? So... It's literally where the mystery ends. I want to go into more mysteries. So. Oh, okay. Drive safe, Slim. Uh, yeah, Slim has a premiere coming up. Which, it, it, goddamn flat earther. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Uh, I will try to come to game night. We'll see. Um, depends on what I have going on. So I still have like an hour and a half to hang out. So... Would anyone like for me to look at anything in particular? I don't know what to do, guys. <laughs> Steve Wilco station hijacking? Did that happen? Hold on, let me look that up. Steve. Oh. Let's see. Let's see, let's see. Next headroom. Hmm. Okay, I saw it listed. Where are you? Oh, okay. Yeah, I actually... <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so... Uh, it wasn't... Okay, so this one was actually kind of fascinating. Uh, it happened to multiple stations uh, in, I think it was two different states, actually. Uh, someone hacked into the emergency broadcast system. <laughs> and broadcasters in Michigan were reporting the same situation. And one of them actually happened during uh, Barney. And... They announced over that that it was zombies. Hold on. Let's see. Let me see if I can find a tape of it. Because it, that one's so interesting. <laughs> Oh, we have news reports of it. Let's watch. Let's see. All I did was sneeze, Alan. <laughs> oh, 
Montana I'll TV show them later. Is beefing up I promise. Computer security after hackers use the station to broadcast a phony zombie alert. Watch. Civil authorities in your area have reported that the bodies of the dead are rising from their graves and attacking the living. The phony emergency alert came during a broadcast of the Steve Wilkos show saying bodies rising from their graves. TV engineers pulled it off the air and replaced it with an apology, but not before it got broadcast over much of Montana. They haven't caught the hackers yet. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, well, see, Voice of America has been prone to a lot of hijackings, uh, but they've also been around since 1923, 1924. Uh, they've actually been signal jammed. They were signal jammed for like seven years in the Middle East because of uh, the potential for propaganda during times of war. Steve Wilkos is a jerk. I agree with that statement wholeheartedly. Nobody likes Steve Wilkos. If they do, they're dumb. Okay, pay attention. A New Mexico TV station sent out an official emergency alert yesterday, not for a tornado or a flood, but for a zombie attack. It was one of four stations around the country that put out the same alert. How could such a thing happen? Alex Tomlin has the answer. Alex? Dick, the alert looked and sounded very real, other than that part about the zombies. Now the feds want to know who hacked the emergency alert system. A warning. You are about to see some serious zombie video. This is The Walking Dead, AMC's hit TV show about the living dead. And it's probably no coincidence that the day after the hit cable show had its highest ratings ever, this happened. Civil authorities in your area have reported that the bodies of the dead are rising from their graves and attacking the living. The fake alert hit at least four stations in the U.S., including... KENW, the PBS station in Portales. Do not attempt to approach or apprehend these bodies as they are considered extremely dangerous. Well, about 2.26 yesterday afternoon, our EAS system, the emergency announcement system, received a message that goes straight out over the air, and uh, the message basically talked about bodies arising from the cemetery. Turns out some of the stations used the same emergency alert system and hadn't updated their passwords to protect the system. By the time the operators realized that this was a bogus message, it had already gone out over all three channels of our uh, digital television. Uh, we immediately took steps to strengthen the passwords uh, of the boxes. News 13 even had a viewer call yesterday afternoon asking if the alert was real. We went ahead and notified the FCC, and I'm sure the FCC will ask stations to be sure that they take steps to see that this doesn't happen again. Whoever is behind the fake alert could face some serious fines from the feds. While this alert was fake, in case there is a zombie attack, remember, the only way to kill a zombie is to sever its head. And, you know, sometimes you don't know who's already made the transition over. Isn't that right, Mark? Uh, that's exactly yeah. right, Alex. What, fact, what's coming here? Well, no, I mean, it's just that it's one of these things where the makeup nowadays is so good. A zombie could be right in front of you or right next to you. Uh -huh. <laughs> you don't even know it, really. uh -huh. Anyway, uh, it was not. Uh, it was one person who did it, and that one person just used the factory default login to get into the emergency alert system um change your passwords people protect things oh hey widows Ooh, that does not sound like fun oh it happened in your home state <laughs> it's awesome oh my gosh Yeah, yeah, it literally happened because they left that default there. Yeah. Uh. 
Yes, I would say that Steve Wilkos is evil. Yeah. I say so. Objectively, he's evil. Now, see, uh, there have been, like, local stations that weren't necessarily hijacked. Their employees just kind of decided to fuck around a bit. Um, so, in Tucson, Arizona, one of the things that happened was in 2009 during the Super Bowl, uh, people on Comcast were treated to, to a few minutes of Wild Cherries 5 porn you know it interrupted the super bowl it was a whole thing uh it affected 80,000 viewers and all comcast did was take ten dollars off of their upcoming cable bill yeah but it was a former comcast employee that was just like fed up and he got three years of probation and a one thousand dollar fine that's all. Speed milk nose. Yeah. Steve Volkos is the worst. Oh, a Shek TV station was uh, interrupted with a spliced footage of an atomic bomb over that day's weather report. It was in 2007. Oh, one of the ones that I really want to look at happened in Australia. It happened on uh, Channel 7 in Australia. The documentary Mayday Head on Collision was airing on there and like the audio was replaced with an eerie loop of an unseen American saying, Jesus Christ, help us all, Lord, fuck. We'll watch it. That's a video. It just it just keeps going. Uh yes. Yes, he did. So <laughs> the channel, like they claim that uh They, they brushed it off as a technical glitch. No one knows exactly what happened still, but uh, the spokesperson was like, oh, the line is actually Jesus Christ, one of the Navarines, and it's from the documentary that was airing. Uh, no. That's... Does that sound like what there's in here? We're not stupid, Australia. <laughs> now, see, one of the things that uh, I actually find interesting about the whole Max Headroom thing is that it's very similar to something that happened in uh, England in 1977. Because someone took over the Southern Television broadcast system and they they uh, claim to represent the Ashtar Galactic Command. And they were sending a message down to humanity to abandon its weapons. And it was like a six minute long thing. Like it was an entire thing. 
Oh, and they said that uh, our planet was in a new age of Aquarius that could only be realized if rulers are made aware of the evil forces that can overshadow their judgments. Baby Jesus is an asshole. Nobody likes baby Jesus. Nobody likes Eve Wilkos. Now we know. Okay, Lizard made a request. He requested Dalgo. Look at that sweet girl. She's the best. Look at that sweet girl. Look at that face. Find him? No, he actually ran that way while you were sniffing around. Okay. We watched a couple Sasha videos. Told you we would. Anyway. Found the alien thing. Fuck yeah. <laughs> I really want to hear this. I want to know what all was said in it. The Rhodesian nationalist leader, Bishop Abel Muzareva, has accepted Mr. Smith's offer to negotiate an internal settlement based on one man, one vote. But, he says, there are conditions. These include stopping the execution of all captured prisoners of war, allowing the rules to take part in negotiations, being arrested. In Australia, Mr. Kerry Packer's cricketers are still pleading the money. This is my court decision. It's the ban on the play test matches. This is the voice of Omar, representative of the Ashtar Galactic Command, speaking to you. For many years, you have seen us as knights and as scholars. We speak to you now, and you say that we must be helped down to your brothers and sisters all over this, your planet Earth. We come to know you of the destiny of your race and your world, so that you may communicate to your fellow beings the course you must take to avoid the disaster which threatens your world and the beings on other worlds around you. This is in order that you may share and try to awaken as the planet passes into a new age of Aquarius. The new age can be a time of great peace and evolution. Your race, but only your rulers are made of general forces that can overshadow their judgments. Be still, no, and rich. Or your chance may not come again. All your weapons of evil must be removed. The time for conflict is now past, and the race of which you are a part may proceed to the higher stages of its evolution if you show yourselves worthy to do this. You have but a short time to learn to live together in peace and goodwill. Small groups all over the planet are learning this and exist to pass on the light of the dawning new age to you all. You are free to accept the rejection of each other's world. Many go as wide as this, then they run out. Here now, the voice of Rilong, representative of the Ashtar Galactic Command, speaking to you. Be aware also that there are many 
false prophets and guides of present operating on your world. They will suck your energy from you, the energy you call money, and will put it to evil ends, giving you worthless loss in return. But in your divine self to protect you from this, you must be utterly sensitive to the voice of him that can tell you what is true and what is Learn to listen to the voice of truth. This is our message. That we can I insist on the little full of only really short ingredients. I can have nine lives. But that's just never caught either. Like, whoever did this intrusion did not get caught. Oh my gosh. Okay, so that one's kind of fascinating. But it's, it's the same concept as the Max Headroom thing, where they were able to take over that signal and no one could stop them. So, all right. Uh, Miss Parker is going live in like eight minutes covering Gale and super excited about that. Um, so I already put the link in the side chat. You guys should go check it out. Um, I am about to dip out of here and I will be putting... Oh, I'm sorry. It's tomorrow at two. My bad. Okay. Delete that. Oh, well. It's tomorrow at two. But today at 3.30, Slim is doing a premiere on his channel. And then uh, at 4 p.m., he is doing the Game Slut stream. So everyone be sure to go check those out. Uh, after the stream, I will be putting all of the resource links inside of the description. Uh, once again, a huge, huge thank you to the Max Headroom Signal Hijacking channel that provided most of the videos that I used. And let me put him back in the side chat so that you all can go subscribe to him. Uh, by the way, I think that maybe he's the one that did it. Just so you know. Because he did a video. Where he did a Q&A. And he said that he didn't do it. So I think he did it. But that's not the point. So thank you guys for being here. Uh, as always, there are still the reproductive health resource links in the description. As well as LGBTQIA plus resource hubs. And all the rest of the Stream Purpose family. Y'all have a wonderful day. I will see y'all around.